and good morning to you all again. Um, today we are in John's Gospel. We're going to look at we're in the first chapter. We're going to look at verses 29 to 42. Now this is a continuation, basically, of where we were at last week with the baptism of uh, Jesus. But here we've switched Gospels. We've gone to John now. Um, so that is on page 862 and 863. I should tell you in the few Bible if you want to follow along. It's entitled The Lamb of God, and then the second section is The First Disciples of Jesus. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that we might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the dove des or the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Chosen One. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. All right. Here we have, again, the continuation of the baptism story. The baptism has taken place prior to this, and John has seen Jesus walk by. This is like two different days that we've got going on here. That Jesus walks by and he declares, here is the Lamb of God. He declares that again later, the second day, when he says, here is the Lamb of God, exactly again. And we've used that symbolism of the Lamb of God for Jesus an awful lot. Uh, typically, we think about it as coming from the Passover Lamb or the, the, uh, the, Egypt, or the Israelites are in Egypt and they have to mark the doorposts and all of that with the, with the, the death of the firstborn. And that is the Passover meal. And of course, that's where Jesus, we, we, we get our communion from that incident. And so that's where we typically think about the lamb. But the lamb, it, it goes back further. The, the imagery of the lamb and the foreshadowing of Jesus goes all the way back to Abraham. Abraham is usually considered, is always considered, the father of the Jewish faith, the Israelites. That's where it came from, the seed of Abraham. And more specifically, through Isaac, his son Isaac. Everything channels down into Isaac, if you are Jewish. It goes to Abraham and Isaac, Jacob. And so you have that troubling story where Abraham takes Isaac out, and he's been told to sacrifice him. And he takes him up the mountain, he leaves the donkey and the servants behind, and he and Isaac go up the hill, and Isaac's carrying the wood that's to be used for the fire, to burn the offering. And he asks his father, where's, you know, where's the offering? And Abraham's God will provide. And of course, he's not going to tell him that he's supposed to sacrifice his son. But yet, when they get to where they're supposed to go, when he's preparing everything, suddenly there's a ram there. A lamb, we would say. God will provide the sacrifice. And he did. That is a foreshadowing of the whole thing of Christ and the cross. That story foreshadows it. As troubling as that story is, and as difficult as it is to preach, there's beauty in it. The beauty of Christ. He is the Lamb of God that was promised all the way back to the time of Abraham. So here we have Jesus going by John 
And John, at first, in the first few verses, 29 to 34, is saying that he, I myself did not know him. How in the world can that be? We know from Luke that he leaps in Elizabeth's womb when Mary comes into the house. John's still a child. He's, he's just a, and, and he's an, and, and an infant in the womb. And of course, Jesus is a smaller infant in the womb. There's a few months, we don't know exactly how many months, probably about six months difference between their age. In the womb, he recognized him as being something special. And they would have been close enough together, and we know from Luke's gospel that Jesus' family went to the festivals. They went every year. John's dad is a priest. He most certainly went to the festivals. They would, have, they would have known each other. There's no way around it. They would have been acquainted with one another as cousins. They had a large, close family. We know that from the wedding in Cana. It was a, was a family wedding as well. But the interesting thing here is gnosis is the Greek word we usually word for no. And here, that's not the word. Everywhere, pretty much everywhere else in John, when they, they translated no, it's gnosis, which is where we get the word gnostic or knowing. Not gnosticism is a heresy. Uh, or we get the word agnostic, which means cannot know, and we run into people that are agnostic. But that's not the Greek word here. The word here is Eden, or is in. And it means, can mean knowing, but it also can say conscious of. John knew Jesus, he just didn't realize he was the Messiah. Or maybe he knew that as a child, but growing up with it, when Jesus was picking on him, or he was picking on Jesus, he forgot it. We don't look at those closest to us often as being prophets, do we? You, you, know, you get the least amount of respect in your hometown. Jesus and Nazareth, they didn't recognize who he was. So John, I think here, is saying suddenly, after the baptism, he's the Messiah. And there's a reason for it. He goes on and talks about it. He saw the Spirit come down. He was told he would see the Spirit come down. On who the Spirit rests? This is the Messiah. And when he baptized Jesus, here we have information that tells us something. That the other Gospels, it's pretty hard to know whether anybody else saw this so if dove or the spirit like a dove come down, but here we know that at least John the Baptist did. He saw that in what we talked about last week, a theophany, of a manifestation of God. Doesn't say whether he heard the voice saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, but it does tell us that he saw the spirit come down. So he knows who Jesus is now. He recognizes it. Now, we can take a little bit of comfort because Later, he sends disciples to question Jesus, are you the one who was promised? Even though he saw a dove come down, even though he'd been promised that, he still, so we can be comforted when we question, even though we should know, because we've witnessed all these things we talked about earlier in prayer time. But we have doubts sometimes. Don't be hard on yourself. Even John, who should have known, grew up with the man, should have known. The next day, they are standing by the water again. And Jesus walks by. And again, he says, here is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, the promised sacrifice. And two disciples hear him. And they go. Start following Jesus. So look, it, it, we have the imagery of them. Jesus is walking, and they're kind of like walking along behind, kind of timidly, maybe even, kind of, you know, not, not sure what to do. And I talked to the children about what would you be if you saw Jesus walk back. Surprised, a little apprehensive, probably, wouldn't you be? If we were going to be honest with each other, would we immediately go run up to him and go, Jesus, and start asking him all the questions that we want to know about from the Bible? Um, I think at first we would just we would be timid, and we wouldn't know what to do, but we want to follow him, because we know he's special. We know there's, this is the Messiah. John just told you this is the Messiah. John should know he was sent to prepare the way. So they follow him. 
And Jesus either sees them or perhaps just senses them. I kind of think Jesus senses them. I think he kind of senses us when we're starting to get maybe a little inkling about maybe there is something about this Jesus guy. And we start timidly following him. I think he knows. And he'll start sending people to witness to you. He'll start sending people to ask you, what are you looking for? And that's the message of Jesus. What are you looking for? The question is, is what are you looking for? What are you wanting from Jesus? Are you wanting peace? Are you wanting counsel? Consoling? Or do you want him to affirm your sins? I'm afraid to say that too many people go to Jesus and want him to affirm rather than redeem their failures. <coughs> we have to be careful when we say come to Jesus as you are. We want you to come to Jesus as you are because we're all broken. So we come to Jesus as we are. But you're supposed to come to Jesus and be changed. You're supposed to come to Jesus and lay down those burdens and lay down those, those sins and to repent, which means to turn and walk a different direction. So it's almost like if you envision in this story, John and the two disciples are going this way, and Jesus walks by that way, and the whole idea of re repentance is that you turn and follow him rather than following John. Not that John was a false teacher. John was like a kindergarten teacher getting you ready for high school or whatever, or an elementary school teacher. And middle school teacher, he was preparing the way, but he wasn't the way. The true way, the only way, is Jesus. And the important thing to ask yourself each day is, what am I looking for? Am I trying to create Jesus in my own image, or am I truly following him in his image? Because you're following him in your own image, you're creating your own Jesus then you're not getting the promise. Because the promise is that he's the Lamb of God. He's the final sacrifice. He's the redeemer of all your failings. Don't hold on to your failings. Hold on to Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for the words of John's Gospel. Lord, let them be written on our hearts. Let us ask ourselves, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for you. We pray this in your loving book.